Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and thanks to the organizing committee to allowing my uh, uh, group to presenting you the state of art on the positive applications and possible positive applications of uh, hydrophobins. I uh, wish to tell you that it are possible positive applications because it is a little bit uh, subject of dreamers. Indeed, uh, don't think that uh, there are uh, still regarding uh, the brewery already positive applications of uh, uh, hydrophobins. I wish to make uh, with you a state of art and at first I wish to remember uh, what are uh, hydrophobins and first the most positive image of uh, the primary gushing. I think that the most positive image of primary gushing was developed by Spa Monopole and uh, by the Piero uh, where uh, they showed the Piero that was pushing on the sparkling bottle and uh, was uh, maintaining the sparkling water inside of the bottle. But uh, when we go over, and uh, I wish to remember what is the structure of uh, the hydrophobin. In fact, the hydrophobin is a peculiar uh, protein, in fact, uh, less than uh, a protein a peptide because it has uh, just a little bit more or more or less than uh, uh, 100 amino acids and uh, these 100 amino acids are uh, located uh, at random in a uh, uh, a structure, and uh, you see here uh, HFB2. And uh, it makes that you have, in fact, two typical zones in uh, this peptide. In fact, an uh, hydrophilic zone at the top and an hydrophobe zone at the bottom. That's what makes this uh, molecule so typical. And uh, you see, uh, in fact, that you have the green zone in the molecule B. The green zone is the hydrophobe part, and the upper part, the gray zone, is the hydrophilic part. I go to the next uh, slide. And uh, you see there, here, L19, I22, A61, V75, L7, just leucine 19 in position 19, isoleucine in position 22, asparagine 61, leucine 7, valine 75. In fact, it are the uh, aliphatic radicals of these uh, amino acids that make an hydrophobic patch a surface that make that is hydrophobic. It is just this that is the main characteristic of this peptide. Of course, is this a strong peptide? Well, yes, it is a very strong peptide. Why? Because the primary structure of this peptide is characterized by four disulfide bridges. Now, what is the state of art regarding? this peptide. Well, if we look in the scientific literature and not in the brewing literature, because that's a major problem for brewers, brewers read just only 
the brewing literature. If you look to the Langmuir, to the review Langmuir, Langmuir is focused essentially on surface, cell surface, and so on. Well, you see that 89 scientific peer-reviewed papers were published between 2005 and 2015 on this topic. And uh, what were the main tackle topics? Well, precipitation and formation of amphiphilic proteic layer with typical characteristics. A second and probably the most important paper regarding hydrophobins and class II hydrophobins concerned the elasticity of a typical crystalline class II hydrophobin layer. And it was described in 2013 by Stanimirova, uh, Stoyanov, and Pelon of the University of Budapest. And then you got the third very important paper for brewers, ciders, and so on, described by Deckers and the group of KU Leuven. It was the affinity of the hydrophobic patch of class II hydrophobins and gaseous carbonic acid. I will now go back to the second paper, elasticity of a typical crystalline class II hydrophobin layer. And look to the, have a look to the abstract of this paper. What first to the title? The title indicates that it is surface pressure and elasticity of hydrophobin HFB2 layers on the air water interface. First of all, take care that the elasticity is typical of class two hydrophobins. No, class one hydrophobin is as solid as wood. It is just a class two hydrophobin that are elastic. Secondly, that, uh, I go further, that the hydrophobin, the class two hydrophobins, possess the highest surface dilatational and shear elastic moduli among all investigated proteins. Then, for the detection, of the hydrophobins. The hydrophobins forms monolayers, but also bilayers and trilayers, and that the compression compact the voids that are formed between the, ga the, the gaps that are formed between the layers. That as I, the pressure as more compact the layer that you form. Very, very important. I read the last sentence. If a hydrophobic layer is subjected to oscillations, its elasticity considerably increases up to 500 millinewton per meter, which can be explained with compaction. to win a little bit time, because I will share my lecture with my uh, assistant. Result also show that relaxation of the layer tension after expansion or compression follows the same relative uh, simple law, which refers to two-dimensional diffusion of protein aggregates within the layer. It means that elasticity is always Conserved. Finally, it is also written 
that uh, the class two hydrophobins are very suitable for the immobilization of functional molecules at surfaces and as coating agents of for surface modification, but this was known since the year uh, 2000, 2005. This is the second uh, aspect. This is the well-known uh, view of the CO2, the attraction of the surface of the patch, uh, the hydrophobic patch in uh, yellow, and the CO2 molecules uh, at the left, uh, the green and the uh, oxygen red that you see attracted by the yellow patch. Uh, yes. Uh, the attraction of the CO2 by the yellow patch, uh, by the hydrophobic yellow patch. What we wish to show you is now the practical aspects regarding valorization. And the valorization of uh, which molecules, of the molecules of hops, in fact, of the hydrophobe molecules of hops and the immobilization of uh, hydrophobe molecules of hops on the hydrophobic patch of the hydrophobin. How uh, and why wish uh, we do that? Why to increase the solubility of poorly soluble molecules? Why also to increase the stability of the emulsion and also to improve the shelf life regarding oxidation. How will we do that? By fixation, by adhesion on the hydrophobic patch of the hydrophobin and also by inclusion in a closed spherical hydrophobic structure using the CO2 nanobubble building mechanism and then I ask you to remember the formation mechanism of the nanobubble causing the gushing phenomenon. And which molecule will we use as a substrate to model hydrophobic molecules that have affinity for the hydrophobic fats of class two hydrophobins, and some examples are osimen and myrsen, also linalol and the citronellol. No, Carla Cordova, who is the PhD applicant that study the possibility of immobilization of these molecules on the hydrophobic patch. Uh, on the hydrophobic patch of class 2. Hydrophobins will show you the manner how this is studied actually. Ah, it's here. Oh, okay. Thanks, Professor. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Well, I am going to continue with this, uh, talking about this uh, promising application, the fixation of aroma compounds on hydrophobins. And I'm actually, I'm going to speak like five minutes, this so briefly. And well, we know that aroma compounds can interact uh, with proteins via hydrophobic interactions and by hydrogen bonds. And in this way, we can make them less uh, volatile. Our group decided uh, to work with two terpenoids, osimin and myrcene. Uh, we can find these uh, terpenoids uh, in oil hopes. And well, I'm going to explain how these uh, uh, proteins can interact uh, with uh, volatile compounds. This is uh, an schematic model of HFB2, osimin, and the mixture of droplets in solution. In the first case, uh, we have uh, just a, a, a schematic representation of how HFB2 can be in a solution. Uh, due to the amphiphilic uh, nature of the molecule, this can form aggregates. And also, well, I, I, I didn't put it here, but 
uh, this protein likes to be in the surface. I mean, because it has a, as my professor said, an hydrophilic and an uh, amphipathic uh, um, structure. In the second uh, image, we have uh, when we mix this hydrophobin with a, an osimine or another a polar uh, compound, uh, that the protein can emulsify this uh, component. And well, in the third case, we just have a solution with osimine, and we can see that the, the droplets are bigger. Uh, but if we go uh, further, we can have something like this. A uh, representation of one, uh, and this. Um, uh oh. Oh, I, sorry. Okay, this is a representation of one uh, osimine molecule. This is that green part. Uh, can interact with the hydrophobic uh, patch of the molecule. This, uh, this one, this one. Ah, thank you. Ah, it's better now. This is the osimine molecule. We can see here some of the hydrophobic residues that conform the hydrophobic patch of the of the protein. And well, this uh, image was created with Pymol, that it's a program that it's uh, that works to visualize uh, protein structures. And and to make more uh, illustrative this uh, interaction, we have this uh, molecular dynamic simulation uh, to show how the osimine molecules can interact with the hydrophobic patch of the, of the protein. In yellow, we have the hydrophobic patch, and all these uh, green structures correspond to the molecules of osimine. In this case, we have the same uh, molecular uh, simulation, but in this case we have uh, the interaction with CO2. We know that when we have these uh, two elements interacting under certain conditions, I mean temperature or in pressure, the phenomenon of Gaussian could be present. And for that reason, we decide to study the competition of these uh, two molecules, I mean uh, osimine or Myrsen or another aromatic compound with uh, CO2 for the hydrophobic patch of the protein. And oh, well, this uh, is another image that is quite similar to the previous one, but in this case, we just uh, pointed the sites where we can find some uh, water molecules in the system, but it's actually very similar to the previous one. And this is a graph or that shows a, a result from a, a preliminary experiment where we can see the evolution of osimine concentration in a solution that contains two different uh, concentrations of HFB2. And we can see uh, as the days go by, uh, the highest the concentration of H. HFB2 use the highest the concentration of osimine remained in solution. Uh, I think that uh, also in this state of art, it is important to mention the other applications of hydrophobins. And in this table, uh, we have some of the most uh, popular uses of these proteins. Uh, we have uh, the from tissue engineering, from uh, drug delivery, and also in the field of nanotechnology. And well, as a conclusion, we have that uh, the production levels of very pure hydrophobins uh, needs to be significantly increased, and especially for the industry. And it is important to put a special attention in the production levels and also in the price. Mm. Also, the immobilization of flavor compounds uh, by using these proteins is another interesting aspect. Uh, in order to keep the aroma, uh, the aroma or, yeah, aroma or, actually, I don't know if we, another application, maybe vitamins or another uh, asset in the interest uh, from the food industry, 
uh, also could have an application. But uh, it is important uh, to say that as the gushing phenomenon should be controlled, it is not logical to add this uh, component to carbonated beverages. And well, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Carla and uh, Professor Derlings, for this uh, talk. Are there questions from the audience, please? You uh, illustrated the applications of potential applications with the uh, hydrophobins of uh, trichoderma. Yeah, from Is that, can that be also give gushings, those type of hydrophins? Uh, I didn't know they can occur in beer. But, well, these uh, proteins, when interact with CO2 under certain conditions, produce gushing. Yeah, but, but they are not found in, in beer. Uh, yeah, they cause gushing in beer. But these proteins mm. are produced by a fungus. Yes, I mean, it's a, a fungus that, con that contamines the barley and goes through the, all the uh, chain of production until the final product. Well, the probability is less lower, it's much lower than in the case of fusarium. Um, I, I really don't know the mm. probability, but they got gushing. Um, yes. The target here is to use uh, the uh, hydrophobin in other conditions eh? and uh, to use the hydrophobin as uh, an adjuvant. And so, uh, when we, first of all, uh, trichoderma is uh, human friendly. Eh? It is arsian, we use uh, the HFB2, uh, it is trichoderma arsianum, which is the the fungus that is used, recognized as human safe, that's first. And when we will use the, uh, the hydrophobin, the class 2 hydrophobin, it is really, it will be, uh, first of all, the hydrophobic patch will be used, uh, not, uh, it will be inactivated, uh, not free for CO2. And secondly, uh, it will be, uh, suitable for and just free for as a flavor source and not for other uh, uh, contamination possibilities. Is that uh, okay? <laughs> I think there is a misunderstanding. It's not the intention to capture aroma compounds in beer that contains hydroformin, it means in gushing beer. Nobody wants to add aroma compounds in gushing beer because the hydroformin is already there. But that's not the intention. The intention is to have a beer, a normal beer, and to add purified hydroformins to a certain concentration at the same time as flavor compounds. And then find out whether there is a difference and the big, the, the big thing that, that we have to, to, to investigate is the competition between CO2 and the compound that we added. Because if we add a compound, a flavor compound, but if there is more attachment of CO2, then you will induce gushing. And of course, that's, we do not want gushing by adding a flavor compound. So the fact that she has to investigate is what are the conditions that establish an exact equilibrium between the binding of CO2 and the flavor compound? That's the whole issue. Yeah. Yes, Adding we... of purified. Yeah. And that's also a big thing. We have to isolate and purify hydrophobins. And that's not easy neither. Okay? Yeah. So, but no, we don't know what to add uh, flavor compounds to gush to beer that is already gushing. That doesn't, because we will not drink the beer that is gushing, it's already gone. But most of it, in certain conditions, will go up to the ceiling, or you will get wet completely. And then we don't want to add flavor compounds anymore. Because Thank you, Professor Verachtert, for uh, stating this clear. That was indeed the idea of this presentation.